At Quite the Thing Media, we aim to bring you the best podcasts produced by independent creators, made without constraints. Well, hello, I'm Dan. And I'm Kyle. We're from Two Bulls in a China Shop, and you made it to the Indie Podcaster with the Podcast Father. Dad? No, no, Kyle, not not your dad. He's the Podcast no. Father. It's more of a uh-huh. general term. At least, still think he wants to play catch or something? You've been searching for a podcast. <laughs> want to know about some great artist? Yeah. You've come to the right place. Indie Podcaster. With your host, the podcast father. Welcome to another episode of Indie Podcaster. I'm your host, Jeff, a.k.a. Podcast Father. Wake me up when September ends. I'm going to be sleeping all month, so it's going to be a while. My good friend, Torch the Poet, joins me. He's from The Crow Show. Candidly, right or wrong? What's up, man? What's up, brother? How are you today? Good, man. So tell the world a little bit about yourself. You are the man, the myth, the legend, the torch, the poet. Oh, my goodness. Trying to big up a brother. Well, born and raised in Chicago, 44 years young, seen a lot, done a little bit more. (laughs) By that, you know, I I haven't had the most clean background. You know, from that has has risen a a man who understands how to be a leader, how, how to certainly mentor the youth, um, help them stay away from getting into trouble and, and repeating some of the idiotic things I've done. And I use my podcast as a, as a way to convey that message. Uh, the Crow Show, which stands for Candidly Right or Wrong. And I feel like there really isn't a right or wrong when it comes to your candor. So that's how that kind of came about. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about everything... Uh, me and my take flight squad, um, along with myself, and we'll talk about everything from childhood trauma, the politics, movies, you name it, just an all-around general conversation. With over 200 episodes in and more to come, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Make sure you check Torch out. But Torch, today, man, I'm going to share my interview with the Prosecutors Podcast, Brett and Alice, the creators of that podcast. These are prosecutors that I like, man. You know, um, at first when, 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 when you told me about that, I'm like, man, me being a Chicago boy, <laughs> I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh prosecutors. Ah. But then, you know, um, how can you not? Like, and they give it to you so raw, yet so intelligently, so methodically. So you definitely have to, you have to be a fan. If you're not a fan, I don't know. Send me your address. I'll come visit. Absolutely. No, I do think they're awesome. And they're a really good story. They're only a year and a half in, and they've had great success. So this is a really good story to share with everybody. And they even give a little bit of advice that I think everybody will find handy. But Torch, true crime is huge, man. You know, I'm, um, I'm definitely starting to, to get into true crime podcasts. I wasn't the biggest fan at first, uh, because I think when a lot of the, the, the true crime podcasts became relevant, so many were kind of, I don't know, they weren't, they, they weren't really giving it to you in the raw. And I don't know if that was because of censorship or, or what have you, but now, you know, there's like, some people are really, really doing their due diligence, their, 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 their research. And you have to, you have to admire that. You have to respect that as well. Absolutely. And these two are awesome. I do want to tell everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Let's take care of a little business though, Torch, before we get into this interview. You know it. Jeff here. I want to talk about a few things that keep this podcast going. If you like the work that I'm doing, I encourage you to share it with a friend. That really is the best way to spread the word about Indie Podcaster. I would love it if you would go to your favorite podcast listening platform. May it be a Apple or Good Pods and leave me a rating. Throw me some stars if you would like. All that word of mouth and sharing reviews of this podcast does help. This podcast and myself are a proud member of Quite The Thing Media. Quite The Thing Media, a podcast that speak to you. Go check out all the great independent creators from around the world. It is a community-based podcast network. Check it out. It's great. QuiteTheThingMedia.com. If you want to check out my page, it's QuiteTheThingMedia.com slash podcastfather. You can request a review for me on site or submit a form to participate on this very podcast. Check it out. 
I highly encourage you to download and listen to your podcast on the Good Pods app. This app is awesome. You can see what your friends and influencers are listening to. They've got groups for all your interests. I've got two groups I highly suggest you check out. I've got the Indie Podcast group. I've also got the True Crime Obsession group. If you're an indie podcaster, Good Pods is for you. They've done crazy amount of things these last couple months to reach out and help indie podcasters. They've got tip jars on there for your podcast. They've got performance charts that are based just on independent podcasts. Make sure you download the app and check it out. PodPage is a proud sponsor of this podcast. PodPage is an amazing resource to build your podcast website. You want them big search engine hits. You want to be out there. You want to leave your mark in the digital world. And this website makes it extremely easy to do that. You can set up your podcast website in just a few minutes. Make sure you check it out, podpage.com. That's enough of all that. Let's jump into this awesome interview. I'm excited. I've got Brett and Alice from the Prosecutors Podcast with me this evening. It is past Brett's bedtime, so we're going to make this snippy. <laughs> yeah, I try to be in bed by 8, so, you know, this is rough. It 8 a.m. <laughs> Brett, Brett actually never sleeps. All he does is write briefs and lawyer all day long. Uh-huh, well, uh-huh. He, he, he likes to take the later hours of the evening, like 11, 12, and go on Netflix journeys as well. That's right. That's right. Share my love of horror movies with everybody. He takes, yeah, yeah. He takes us on that journey, but no, I'm excited. I feel like I've been wanting to talk to you guys for a while now, and I've been listening to your podcast. I'm going to relate it to something that happened in my childhood. So growing up in the early nineties, going to elementary school, you used to have these athletes. They would have like little books that were easy to read, you know, when your reading level was low. And in the back, it had like a section where you could write to the athlete. And I went to like all the NBA basketball players, guys, and I, and I wrote to like dozens and dozens of them. And Clyde Drexler responded. Well, it wasn't really Clyde Drexler. I still have the card. It's like a postcard. It was his fan club. So I tell him about how awesome he is and all that. And I get a card back. It's pre-printed and it says, thanks, Jeff. You're in my thoughts and prayers or something. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's all I got out of it. But anyways, it still felt cool. Like knowing an athlete wrote me back. So I'm mm-hmm. comparing you guys to the Clyde Drexler. So you can't be We're in our thoughts and prayers too. So yeah, no one's ever <laughs> compared us to any sort of professional athlete in yeah. our lives. So. Certainly not me, maybe Alice. Alice is a woman of many talents, but <laughs> not athletics. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, thank you. And I'm excited about this conversation just to kind of hear about you guys more because you're literally prosecutors. Like that is the podcast, right? Not only is that the name, that literally is a significant part of that. So how did you guys get into that? Was there's like a certain case in your local area that made you want to get into that? Did your parents do it? I mean, usually there's like a reason somebody goes down that career path. It's certainly not for the faint of heart. You're you're right about that. I won't steal all of the wind, but for me, it was very personal. Um, My parents are immigrants and my grandparents um, lived at the time that, you know, the communists took over China and they had to flee. Um, And I really got to see in kind of my own family life, um, all the cousins are living in different countries around the world. And I'm the only one who practices in the United States and to kind of just really see the effects of having a justice system that is blind is so powerful. You know, my grandparents didn't get justice. They, they literally lost everything in their lives from money to jobs to their daughter who they had to leave behind in um, another country. And so I think I've always grown up with this deep sense of everyone should be treated the same under the law, no matter if they are those who are wealthy, those who have nothing, everyone should enjoy the same level of justice. And so that's kind of what drew me to um, the prosecutor role. Incredible. I, Brad, I don't know how you're going to top that, but go ahead. I know. I know. My, my story, I, I just kind of feel like we should move to the next question. But <laughs> 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 yeah, my story is nowhere near as, uh, as interesting as Alice's. But uh, I never, I mean, I did not grow up wanting to be a prosecutor. I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I'm not really sure why, but I always wanted to be a lawyer. And I spent the first year of my career working at a, at a big multinational law firm. It was the worst experience in my life. I mean, easily the worst experience in my life. I hated it. I hated everything about it. And, but a year into it, I left to go clerk for a judge. 
which had always been my intention. I was going to go leave clerk for a judge and I was going to come back to the law firm, which is a pretty common thing that a lot of people do. And in clerking for that judge, I saw the other side of the law. I saw what prosecutors do and defense attorneys do every day. And from that point forward, uh, I knew that I didn't know if I wanted to be a prosecutor, but I wanted to be in public service. I wanted to do legal work that that helped people, not, you know, I mean, I have no problem with, you know, people making money and corporations making money, but I didn't care to work to increase the bottom line of some, you know, big corp- faceless corporation, right? Like I, I wanted to do public service. And from that point on, I, I've always done that. And when this opportunity to to join the office that Alice and I are with now came along, it was sort of a no brainer. And it's really been one of the, if not the best jobs I've ever had. Awesome. So I kind of had a two part question there. What sort of um, crime, I don't want to say crime event, but was there a murder or a mystery in your, in your local area that really intrigued you when you're younger? Cause I can think of several for myself. I talked about this on a previous episode. I remember visiting my cousins in California and talking about the, well, it wasn't the Golden State Killer then, but East Area Rapist and then the original Night Stalker. I remember just being so terrified hearing about that in my childhood when I go to visit them. Is there anything like that for you guys that really like sparked your interest in true crime? So when I was young, I was probably in maybe third or fourth grade. There was a prominent young attorney uh, in the town that I'm from who was kidnapped in a very sort of brazen kidnapping. Her and her husband were coming home late at night and there were, there were people waiting and they grabbed her and kidnapped her. And it became a, like a big story, national story, but they never found her. They found the people who did it. And one of them ended up being killed or killing himself. It's a little unclear in the police action, and, but they never found her. And to this day, they've never found her. And that's been sort of a story. And I remember when it was happening when I was younger and everybody was talking about it. It was this big thing. And that mystery has just existed where I'm from for so long. And that was certainly the first time that I was exposed to anything like that. And, and really I've, I've been interested in that case for a very long time. And every now and then it's like a lot of these cases every decade or so, there'll be a new tip that, Oh, you know, she was buried in this mine shaft. And if you just go there, you'll find her and the police and the FBI and everybody will show up and and do this extensive search, but they never do. And that was certainly the first one for me and really kind of sparked my interest in true crime in general. The, so I'm a really, big scaredy cat. I don't really like, you know, following true crime because it's too close to home for me. But I've shared this before on our podcast, but the first case that I just kind of became completely obsessed with was a girl, uh, Annie Lay, was a medical student at Yale when I was a law student there. And it was the beginning of the school year and she just disappeared. We were all on campus and, um, you know, the Yale Daily News was reporting on it, you know, every single day. There was a curfew for students because they didn't know if, you know, there's a kidnapper or a murderer on the loose on campus. And um, she was, you know, a a woman who looked a lot like me. We were about the same height, same weight. She was in the medical school. I was in the law school and she had disappeared on the eve of her wedding. And so there was a lot of, you know, rumors flying around um, that, you know, she ran away because she didn't want to marry the man or the man had actually kidnapped her or murdered her. And I kind of saw in real time rumors taking root based on nothing and kind of ruining a lot of people's lives. And tragically, she was found. um, She was murdered and stuffed into the walls of the medical research building on campus, just, you know, like a mile from where I live. And it was just, it gripped the entire campus. It gripped me. Um, She, it could have easily been me in the sense that, you know, we were just a mile or so apart. And I remember thinking, seeing true crime happen in real time and how it affected people's lives. Everyone on campus was terrified, whether they were a woman or a man, um, whether they were in the med school or not, undergrad or grad school. And seeing how the the community kind of rallied together as well to to seek justice for her and um, eventually to uh, you know prosecute and convict her killer. Connecting the dots here, you guys came together through through work. I assume you said you worked at the same office or whatever. How far into your careers did that happen? Oh, Alice, we met what five years ago? I guess I about five years ago. I was yeah, really young back ago. then. You didn't seem young, Alice. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Alice and I have actually worked in two jobs together. So the current job we have and the last job we have. 
And basically, I, I had this big project I had to work on. And I, I couldn't do it myself. I mean, I, I just couldn't do it. I needed somebody smart who could actually handle it. And I sort of put out like the word, like, I need somebody. I'm drowning. Help me. And somebody suggested, I actually forwarded it. I found the email just by random chance um, that somebody had sent me with Alice's resume. And I forwarded it to her. I was like, hey, look, it's an email. And Alice ended up coming and working on the project. And that's how we became friends. And we've been friends ever since. Is that how you recall the story, Alice? That's exactly what it was, except, <laughs> except Fred's being too humble. It really, it really was by chance. So we had a mutual friend who said, you know, I would be a good fit for the job. I had to leave my current job to go help uh, with the project. And it was so fun. I mean, we were spending 18, 20 hours a day together on this project for like months. It, you were going to either love each other or hate each other. And who knew from that experience, a podcast would eventually be born. <laughs> And you, if you've listened to the podcast, you know, like Alice is a ray of sunshine. And during this project, I remember I would just be like, Ugh, and I'd be walking in the hall and here's Alice. She'd come bouncing through this big, huge smile. And I don't know, Alice, Alice is like the light that lights up the room. So <laughs> <laughs> he always has the nicest compliments, doesn't he? He really does. Like no one is this nice to me. Certainly not my own family. <laughs> nope. Nobody at work says that about me. You know, they don't say Jeff's just. <laughs> sunshine oh That's he's awesome. terrible to me at work <laughs> oh okay gotta have an even mixture there so yeah. i assume you guys aren't always working on like cases that are extreme as the stuff that you're covering on your podcast right at what point in time and how long did it take you're, you said it, you're spending several hours a day together you know 18 hours you used as an example at what point in time did you realize you had so much in common as far as interest on true crime go I mean, let's let's be honest. We actually have very little in common, which makes the podcast work, I think. I agree. No, I agree. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'll let Brett say this, but I we really don't have very much in common, except that we love hanging out with each other and we hang out at work. We hang out with our families. Those of you who think, you know, in the in the um, Reddit world who think that we absolutely must be having an affair, our spouses love each other. <laughs> <laughs> let's just get it out there. Um you know, our spouses love each other. Our kids hang out together. Um, and we just really like hanging out with each other. And as you all know, Brett is the world's best storyteller. And he would just tell stories to me all the time to pass the time, you know, on our coffee breaks, on working some long hours on some trial. And he would just tell me the most amazing stories that I'd never heard. He knows everything about true crime. And I was like, you should really like do something with this. You should tell stories for a living. <laughs> And he said, you should do it with me. And I was like, absolutely not. Um, but I'll let Brett keep going with the story from there. You know, she says absolutely not. But in reality, I was like, hey, let's do this podcast. And she was like, OK, let's just do it. And I was like, are you sure? Because I think this is going to be a little bit more of a commitment, maybe. And she's like, no, no, let's do it. And so <laughs> so we did it. And I'm not really sure what whether Alice thought I just would not follow through on it. Like I was just sort of blowing smoke or something. I 100% but... thought you would not follow through. <laughs> Yeah. And then I like, you know, bought all the equipment. And before I pushed by, I was like, now you're sure, right? Before we like buy the microphones and everything else, you're sure you want to do this. And, and, you know, here we are, but yeah, back before COVID we hung out all the time and that's what we would do, you know, to like blow off steam when I was laying on her couch or when we went to get coffee or whatnot, that's, that's what we do is talk about true crime. Like I would tell her about Maura Murray and how crazy Maura Murray was. And, and that's, that's how we got started. We just took a flyer on it. You know, I mean, Started recording episodes and putting them out there and seeing if anybody would listen to them or if everybody hated them. And, and here we are. When was the first episode and how long before the first episode did you guys put together this plan? Did you record ahead quite a bit on some stuff or? We recorded so, the first episode the week before the COVID outbreak. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so our first episode, we were together in the same room recording. And then from that point on, it's been Alice in her closet like she is now and me in, in my room. <laughs> we record them like this. I mean, we're on the phone together and she's recording where she is and I'm recording where I am. So yeah. So basically, you know what? I think March 13th is the day people point to is sort of the beginning of the COVID outbreak. I mean, it wasn't the beginning of the outbreak, but when, you know, the NBA shut down and everybody started canceling mm -hmm. things. And, um, and so we had literally recorded our first episode the week before that we didn't end up releasing anything until May. So, cause we did want to get ahead because we just didn't know. Right. I mean, we didn't know, how often we'd be able to do it and who knew what the world was going to be like. So we recorded probably 10, 12 episodes before we released the first one. And then, and then just went forward from there. So when you've listened, it was kind of funny. I'm sure if you listen to the first episode in the middle of May or the end of May, 
you know, we're talking about this, this COVID thing that's out there, but hopefully it's not going to be a big deal. And then the next week we're, we're locked down. So, <laughs> yeah, for me, really podcasting in my life, like I, I did a lot of radio stuff and, and had some content on the internet really long time ago in college. It wasn't called podcasting then though. In the recent years, I'd say last five years, I listened to like a lot of pro wrestling podcasts. That's what kind of like introduced me to podcasts. Then obviously mm-hmm. like serial and, and then, then I got into the true crime garage and stuff like that. So you guys probably had influence as far as podcasts goes. What were they exactly? Well, true crime garage is a big one. Um, yeah. I mean, serial, I think everybody serial was a gateway drug for a lot of people into podcasting and I like serial, but honestly, I always liked the true crime garage sort of two people just talking about crime, right. Or just talking about a story and, and less, scripted and more of a discussion and you always felt like listening to that podcast that you were kind of part of it you know that you were it was just sort of like hanging out with a couple guys literally in their garage drinking beers talking about this very interesting thing and so that was one thing we wanted to do we wanted it to be much more of a sort of conversation like i really enjoy like the trail went cold for instance but it's totally different from what we do and i know a lot just of like case files i mean it's yeah like case files same thing right and i know people love that and they love that and and that's fine and as I've said a million times, there are plenty of podcasts and plenty of people out there. There's lots of different things for different people. But for us, the sort of com- conversational thing, I think, number one, I think it works. And Alice said in a recent podcast, and this is totally true, that we sort of start off talking about these cases. And even as we're recording, we're sort of thinking about things and bouncing things off of each other. And I think that makes for a much more sort of interesting final product. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I loved Serial, obviously. I loved serialized podcasts. But the one thing that I thought a lot of podcasts were missing that I was hoping, you know, we didn't want to just put something out there that had already been done was I would be asking questions out loud as I listened to podcasts. Had you thought about that? Well, why did that test come back? And then there was an obvious follow-up question that I would say out loud when I was listening to just about any podcast. And we, you know, obviously you can't cover everything, but that's kind of one of our goals is to be able to talk through all of the, all of these things as if it were our jobs. Our job is to think of every tangential argument and know how to respond to it. And that's kind of what you see from our podcast. Yeah. Half of what we do when you're a prosecutor, half of what you do, and I do this all the time, and I'm sure Alice does too, is you're sitting down with an, with an agent, police officer or whatnot, and they're telling you why this ca- is a good case and why it's ready to go, right? And you know they're telling you the story, and then you're thinking of questions. And you're like, well, have you thought about this? Well, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Right? And, and I sort of feel like that's almost what we kind of do in the podcast too, is as you're thinking about the story, you're thinking of like holes in the story and questions that need to be answered and and things that maybe people haven't considered before. And we say, you know, as prosecutors, and and we said this a lot, that it was never just going to be crime, right? Like we were going to do sort of mysteries and and that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And and that we thought that the way we approach things and the way we think about things and how we've been trained to do things as prosecutors is helpful in that. So like the Dyatlov pass case is not a true crime case, right? But we did five episodes on it and I think it was pretty well received because you're looking, no matter what you're doing, you're looking at evidence and analyzing evidence and thinking about questions and questions that need to be answered. And that's what, that's our approach, no matter what the case is. And also uh, you guys can probably tell this from listening to our episodes, the bulk of it is not scripted. Um, we know generally what we're going to talk about, but the fun of it and why it's so alive is that we are having a real conversation. Brett says things that I don't anticipate all the time, and then it sets off another question and another question. And you know, we try to stay within a lane, but it's really fun because it's kind of this like mental volleyball back and forth. Yeah, going into that with a little bit more detail, you both definitely bring like you have your own role for this podcast for sure. Brett, how would you describe your role? You're kind of like the wild card guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah, the great bassy did it guy. Controversy guy. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. Um, oh, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't know. I never really thought about it that way. I never really thought about having a role so much. Cause I don't, you know, I really think, and we've said this before, that that we are co host, right? Like there's no yeah. Because there are podcasts where there's one person who very clearly is the host and they're the one who's doing everything. And the other person is kind of almost a straight man, right? Like that they're bouncing things off of and, and is set up to sort of ask questions or, or whatever. Um, you know, and I think the guys from True Crime Garage would say that. Now, I don't I think the captain gets nowhere near as much credit as he deserves for for what he knows mm-hmm. about true crime and, and his knowledge about that. 
But I think most people think of Nick as like the true crime guy who knows anything about true crime. And the captain's kind of there to sort of help him out and, and kind of push him along and to do the, do the music, right? And, and I just, I think for, for Alice and me, it's not, it's just not like that. Like it is much more sort of a, a very equal partnership. I'm proud to announce that the podcast father, myself, Jeff, and PodPage are teaming up for this sponsorship. PodPage is great, guys. Like I was telling you earlier, it is so critical to have an actual podcast website. I know the link trees are used a lot, but you need an actual website. You need something that's going to show up in Google. You need something that's going to show some hits, a trail that will lead to your podcast. And there's not a better way to do it than PodPage. You can build a beautiful podcast website in five minutes. Automatically create a listener-friendly podcast site from your RSS feed. Customize the design to create a professional look you'll be proud of in just a few clicks. There is no coding or technical knowledge necessary. There's a free trial to give this a shot. And there's different packages ranging from free to all the goods and gadgets, but still at affordable prices. PodPage is big supporters of indie podcasts, so make sure you support them also. Go on PodPage.com and get your podcast website set up. With that being said, we will roll into this segment sponsored by PodPage, where we will play a trailer from a different indie podcast every episode. I hope you enjoy it and give them a listen after you're done listening to my show. Then afterwards, we'll jump back into the interview. Hi there. Welcome to a new and exciting podcast. My name is Jim Gillis. I'm a certified dog behaviourist based in Glasgow. I have recently set up a podcast called Barking from the Rooftops, covering all areas of animal behaviour. We bring on guests from all over the world who are experts in their respective fields. We talk to dog trainers, behaviourists, PhD experts, ethologists and a wide range of other professionals. We discuss cutting edge behaviour modification treatment techniques and advancements in the field of animal behaviour, all with the world's leading experts. We have two episodes ready for launch, the first one with Michael Shikashio, a world leading dog aggression expert, and the second with Dr. Susan Friedman, a world renowned expert in the field of animal behaviour. The podcast will be available to launch soon, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you. I, I guess when I met Roll, like, I guess what I was kind of saying is you're very different, and that's what makes it work, like we were talking about. You couldn't be exactly like Alice or even similar to Alice and it probably wouldn't work near as well. It wouldn't be talking right now. Both of you bring a different dynamic. Alice is definitely more calm and thoughtful. I think than I am like, if it, like I, I, I tend to, sometimes I get on kind of a rant <laughs> you know? and, and I feel like, you know, and I can be a little bit more emotional, I think than Alice, Alice is much more, I think even keeled and stay steady. And you see that in some of the episodes where I'll sort of like go off on something. And Alice will say, well, that it might be that, but maybe it's this thing that, that is actually probably what it is. And that's a much more sort of realistic thing. And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, you're probably right. That's not, <laughs> that makes sense. Which, so, by the way, it's like our flipped roles in real life. So <laughs> really? definitely not the calm one in real life. <laughs> I don't believe. <laughs> so you would agree with, you would agree with what Brett said there. I think you have to have somebody like Brett. You have to have somebody like Alice. I mean, Brett says what's on his mind, then you kind of bring him back down to earth sometimes. But yet he, Brett also says things that make you think. I mean, you do as well, but I mean, he's not afraid to say something that he's thinking about that maybe I would be a little bit hesitant to say about because it could come across wrong. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I think you're right. Brett is, um, he's a really creative thinker and he doesn't really care if what he's going to say may seem crazy. And so many times in, in our real lives too, not just podcast life, he'll say something and it's like bombastic and just on its face outrageous. And before I can roll my eyes, he's like, hear me out. And then by the time <laughs> he's finished explaining it, like the owl theory, I'm like, you know what, dang it. I really believe you. <laughs> and, um, you know, th- that's how the owl theory discussion actually went. He was like, you know, people think it's the owl. And I started laughing because I thought he was pulling my leg. And then he's like, hear me out. And this is, you know, off off recording. We were talking about it. And by the end, I was like, you're right. I think it's the owl. But I think other people may think, oh, the rest of the world will think we're crazy for even bringing up that the owl could have done it. So let's not even present it as a theory. But the reason, you know, these cases are unsolved for the most part is because 
there's something crazy about them, right? There's something unpredictable. There's something that's out of the ordinary that we can't predict that's not rational for how we typically live our lives. And so sometimes you do have to think outside the box. So yeah, Brett's mind works in ways that I don't know, I, I can't match. Well, Alice, the, Alice, this is a really good point that Alice brings up. This is stereotypical. This is like the podcast where Alice brings up a good point. So well, the great thing about Alice is she is such a rational person that if you do have sort of a crazy idea, and the Al theory is one, I think the Vassy theory is the other. What I love about Alice is she she is she has an open mind, right? So she will listen, even if she thinks it's crazy in the beginning, she will listen to what you have to say and she'll weigh the argument and she's willing at the end, kind of like the Al theory, to say, you know what, that actually makes more sense than I thought it was. And that's, that's really valuable um, because... You know, you just never know how crazy is this thing I'm going to say, right? <laughs> like, and it's nice to have somebody like Alice, who both is a is smart and logical, but also open minded and able to sort of process that. And then as far as the how people are going to react, I mean, one thing I've definitely learned through this podcast is no matter what you say, someone is going to hate it. You know, someone's going to hate it and they're going to be really mean about it. Like, that's just that's just reality. Right. And they're going to take something you said the wrong way. And you're going to say. You know, what I love, and we do this all the time, and it never fails. We will say something like, we are not saying that this is the reason to believe that this person did it or didn't do it. We'll say that a thousand times. And invariably, somebody will say, I can't believe you think just because of this, they did it. And it's like, dude, I literally said, we literally said that that's not the reason. But yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to do this, you do, to a certain extent, just have to throw caution to the wind and just be yourself and just tell people what you think and... And I actually think most people will respect that. Oh, I agree. And I think that we talk about like you guys bringing your skills as prosecutors to this podcast. It probably helps you guys doing that career that you'll have a little bit thicker skin because I'm sure you guys get some heat on your everyday jobs and the things you do right or wrong. Uh, Then you have a podcast like this. And I know an example would be, and I love the Delphi episodes you guys did. People like the person on Reddit that just took all their crap down, they're pissed. So Mm -hmm. do you think your roles and your careers that you have now kind of help you have that thicker skin to put up with these? And I even saw the review that you posted the other day, Brett, the the comments that people make and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think we get yelled at all day. And it's funny. In our jobs, we get yelled at by judges, by defense counsel, by defendants. I mean, literally, someone screamed at me today. Why are you ruining my life? You know, like I because I'm prosecuting mm-hmm. them. Um, we, I, I, I hear that like every single day. And then I come home and my children tell me that I'm ruining their lives. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then I record a podcast and people write how I'm ruining their lives <laughs> on the internet. And it's, you know what? It is just what it is. And it's okay because, you know, we have so much fun doing what we do, right? We believe in what we do, both in the podcast world and in our roles as prosecutors. And we only do it because we truly believe that we are contributing good to this world. And with that will come critics and that's okay. As long as, you know, I, tr- I try to keep an open mind. If something is serious that I need to change about myself, I always bounce off. Right? I'm like, do I need to, do I need to change this about myself? Am I really a life ruiner? And, you know, he'll, he'll kind of say, you know, don't, don't listen to that. Or, you know, you could, you could probably tone this down or something, but I think you're right. Uh, it might just be the society we live in today and um, that there's just a lot of yelling and we try very hard to keep that civil discourse with people who disagree with us, with people who agree with us. You know, some of our favorite emails are people who vehemently disagree with us and lay out all the reasons that we're wrong about some episode and do it in a coherent and respectful respectful manner. And we respond and we thank them for the dialogue because our purpose of putting this information out there is for civil discourse to happen. Once we lose civil discourse, I think, you know, a lot, we lose a lot in our society, uh, both in the courtroom, in true crime, in real life. Um, I know that's meta and everyone thinks what they do is going to change the world. But, you know, we, we talk about what we hope the role of our podcast is. And I do hope that we are bringing more civil discourse to um, the true crime community and hopefully broader. Yeah, I think it just seems like there are a lot of people who they want to think the worst of you no matter what, right? Like they want to assume that whatever you said, you know, whatever the worst possible spin to put on it, that's what they're going to say. And we see that sometimes. Now, I have been I've been pleasantly surprised because I actually don't think it's that bad. Um, You know, I post, you know, jokingly some of the negative reviews we get on Apple because some of them are really funny. (laughs) But for the most part, 
people have been, most of the emails we get are exactly what Alice said. I mean, there may be people who disagree with us, but you know, we had one recently, we talked about this in, in a recording we just did and we're about to, you know, we're going to release in a couple of weeks. We had somebody who emailed us and told us that they really didn't, they disagreed with us completely on Darley. They definitely think Darley Routier is innocent. Um, but they love our podcast and we're so professional and they really appreciate the professional way that we approached it. And it's like, yeah, that's great. You know, you don't have to agree with us, but you know, you'd also don't have to think that just because we think the opposite of what you do, that we come from a bad place. You know, we get these, you're so biased, you know, you're biased this and you're biased that sometimes. And it's like, no, I mean, you may think that, but maybe we just disagree. You know, maybe we both just come at something from different points of view you know, we, we, the funny thing is we get, we get reviews on Apple that say we're a bunch of woke prosecutors who think everybody's <laughs> innocent. And then we get them that say, we're just a bunch of evil prosecutors who think everybody's guilty. And it's like, well, I guess if you're getting both kinds of, <laughs> of things that you must be doing something right. Before I ask you more like content creation questions, and this is going to be a difficult question. You may not be able to answer it, but is there a case that you've covered on your podcast that really has tugged at your emotions a little bit more than any of the others. And I referred to the Delphi case because to me as a listener, I feel like that may have been one. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think Delphi was the one that tugged at both of our heartstrings, certainly for me. I don't know if it's the both of us having young children or you know, both of us growing kind of, uh, growing up in smaller towns where we could go out and go for walks with our friends. I, that's all I did as a kid. And to be so carefree and to see the innocence robbed from an entire town, from not only from those girls, but from every, everyone who knew about that case, everyone who's heard about that case, I think had a bit of their innocence robbed. And I think it's just devastating for, uh, for all of us. It, the normal things about that case grip all of us, right? That there's video, that there's audio, and we still can't catch the person, that so little information is known. We don't know how they died, what their bodies were. Um, like what the signatures were. There's so many questions, but every true crime case has a lot of those questions. I think it was really seeing ourselves as well as maybe our kids in Libyan Abbey that really tugged at my heartstrings. And I want it solved because that's not the world I want to live in. A, a world where you know young girls um, can be snatched from this earth within a, an hour's time. Yeah, and... You know, I, I know this is cliche to a certain extent. We actually got somebody who complained about me saying this before, but I'm going to say it again. As a parent, it's just different for me now than it used to be. I never thought that any of this would affect me. I mean, I never thought that either listening to true crime or talking about true crime would have any impact on me personally. Like I just didn't, I, I always felt, I always felt like I could separate it from my real life. And then we, we did, you know, we did Delphi and then we did the Evansdale girls uh, Elizabeth and, and Lyric. And then we, and then we did Jeffrey McDonald and then we did Dolly Routier. And I, and I just had to tell Alice, like, we can't, we just got to stop, but we can't keep doing these kids cases anymore. Like I was starting to have nightmares and I was literally having nightmares about my kids um, <laughs> related to these cases. And I was fine. And I was like, we just got, we got to move. We got to do something else for a little while. And we actually said that in one of our episodes and it's true. Like we, we are not doing any kids for a little while. We're going to like do some other types of cases for a while because it really did start to just wear uh, on me mentally and really affect me in just a way I didn't, I didn't expect. And yeah, I mean, I think the first one that really was hard for me was there's something wrong with Aunt Diane, which is another one, right? Where all these kids die. And, and it's just, ah, I mean, I just can't, I cannot imagine that. Like I, I can't. And even at the time, just recording it, I remember getting choked up, even talking about it. And I don't know, I just, I don't know, I don't know how you can, and they're important cases. I mean, that's the problem, right? Like there's, it's, 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 it's a real double-edged sword because as we've said, like we need to talk about Evansdale and Delphi as much as possible. Maybe not, you know, Jeffrey McDonald and Darlie Retier don't matter as much, um, but those cases are unsolved and, and they need to be solved. And the only way they'll be solved is if we keep talking about them because there are people out there who know something. And, and the more we talk about them, the more ears hear it the more important it is. So I understand it's important to talk about those cases. Now, I would never say don't talk about them, but just be prepared. When you dive into cases about kids, it, it is going to affect you. And I agree. And for me, the Delphi case, like, like Alice said, it's just crazy to think there's a video and there's still no real answer yet. But I won't, I won't stay on that all day. That is a tough one. And it's answered different because I talked to Captain 
he was kind of along with what you said, Brett. It, it does get to him. He has to make sure that he's doing things when he's away from it that are completely opposite. So he doesn't, so he can't have that time away from it. I talked to, you know, Robin Warder from the trail went cold. He it didn't, I didn't get the impression or he make the comment that it had got to him yet. And he has been doing it for as long as captain, all the, you know, the true crime garage guys. So I think it's really depending on what you're covering exactly and who you are for sure. You guys actually spoke with Kelsey German and people like that. So, you, so you're doing more than just sitting down and recording episodes. You're going out, you're talking to the families and there's a lot more work into it than just you guys meeting up, scheduling a time and doing the podcast. Talk to me about that and how meaningful that's been. And if you guys got a lot of feedback and, and the families being thankful, the victim's families. So here's the thing, you know, true crime. We've said this before. A lot of people have said before it's entertainment for people, but at the core of it, there are victims, there are victims, families, there are victims, kids, parents, um, and they have to kind of relive the worst days or days of their lives over and over every time new media comes out about um, their loved one. And they may want that because it keeps the story alive. It keeps people talking about it, keeps the attention on it. Some of them may even solicit it. It doesn't mean it's not difficult for them to continue to live this horrendous tragedy over and over. And we recognize that. Maybe it's because in our jobs, you know, uh, victims' rights are, there's a statue on it. Um, We very much care about who our victims are. There are certain rights that are afforded to them. We speak with witnesses and we just wanted to extend it here. We thought the very least we could do is if we're going to cover one of your loved ones and we could access you through Twitter or some other medium, we would at least reach out. A lot of people ignore the request, which I frankly probably would if someone emailed me out of the blue and I'd never heard of them. or like, I don't want to talk to you about the worst day of my life. Many people have um, taken us up on the offer to speak and we we never record them. Um, it's it, We tell them that we just want to talk to them and they have full right to tell us that we can't put Um, any of what they have told us in the podcast, because we respect it first and foremost, before podcasts, before anything we do, this is their story to tell. It's their life. Now we tell them the reason we're talking to them is we hope by covering their loved one's stories, we can shed light or look at things a different way that can maybe spark some sort of, you know, break in the case. And that's why they talk to us but we are very cognizant that they have no reason to talk to us and they should really control their story. And for the most part, people have been willing, once they respond to us, willing to talk to us, the kind of the humility uh, in these calls have been amazing because they have lived through something that I've never had to live through and continue to speak with courage and kind of an eternal fight for their loved one. Um, I can't even imagine the strength that takes. And um, they've been so respectful to us when I think it's really, it should be the other way around. We should be thanking them. Like I'll say, we don't record it uh, because it's not really, you know, all these people, they, they often, they are being recorded and they appear on shows. And I just always feel like if, if you're being recorded, you're more guarded. Maybe you don't, you're, you're more careful with what you say. And we really just want to hear really their, what their heart is telling them about this case with the knowledge that number one, we're not recording them. So we can't use it verbatim. And number two, anything they tell us, they don't want us to talk about. We won't talk about. And, you know, the Kelsey talking to Kelsey, for instance, I won't go into our conversation, but there were parts of it that really did influence uh, some of the things that we focused on that maybe we wouldn't have focused on as much. We're not going to hide what we think or anything like that, but it does sort of shape what you're going to say, even if you don't learn anything, right? Like even if there's no bombshell from, from your conversation, I think the one (laughs) <laughs> that was probably the most bombshelly uh, was the Mary Morris murders out of Houston, Texas. And we talked to a lot of people there and got like a lot of interesting information. And then look, I mean, there have been, there's one, there's one instance in particular where we emailed somebody and they just, they lost their minds that we, that we emailed them. And I would not, they were not a victim. I'll say that much, uh, but they did not want to talk about it. And they did not appreciate the fact that we were talking about it. <laughs> so, so it does happen. But I think Alice is right. I mean, giving people the opportunity to have their voice heard is important because it is entertainment and and we don't shy away from that. You know, I mean, it is entertainment. It just is. And, and there's that bothers some people, frankly, about true crime. Like it bothers some people that true crime is entertainment because at the heart of it, it feels like you're being entertained by somebody's worst day and their family's worst day and their ongoing tragedy. But I think if you can also use it 
to achieve something like figuring out who did it or educating people on certain aspects of the law or, you know, mental illness or, or whatever, then I think, uh, I think it is worthwhile to do. Well, I have you both on here. A lot of my audience, at least about 50% are podcasters or people that, you know, create content. I want to get some advice out there that you guys, from you guys, pick your brains a little bit. Listening to your podcast when you were approaching or at that, you know, around that year mark, you had this amazing achievement of a million downloads. And I remember you guys not really celebrating, but discussing it briefly. And Alice made the comment, Brett, didn't you think it was like a goal would have been like 10,000 or something? And just talk about how much that had to exceed your expectations, because I've done a lot of different forms and done a lot of different things. And that's just an amazing achievement. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it blew our minds, you know, as simple as that. Um, because, and you know this, I mean, the true crime space is very crowded. There's a, there are a lot of options. There are a lot of options and there are only so many hours in the day for people. And I think that's something we always remember that people are giving us their time when they listen to our podcast and we want to give them back the best, the best product we can give. And I think we have an advantage because we do have this sort of unique thing. I mean, we have a hook, right? I mean, one of the advices people always give to people who want to start a podcast is have a hook. Have some reason that somebody should want to listen to you. And the fact that we are prosecutors is helpful in that. But I mean, I think just doing our best to to put out the best content we can. But I also really think it's important. And this sort of piggybacks off what we were just talking about in true crime. Remembering that you're always talking about real people, even even the perpetrators, right? Like even the, the guys who did it are still real people. I mean, they're still human beings. And sometimes... And I, I am guilty of this occasionally. Like I get mad sometimes <laughs> in cases. And I'll and as we talked about earlier, I will go on rants, right? You know, like Alice, the Matrice Richardson case just really bothers me. And Alice had to just keep me on the rails. If you listen to the podcast, you can tell that I'm like going off the rails over and over again. And Alice is keeping me there. And I think just trying to be as respectful for everyone involved, even if you think they're the bad guys, even if you think they they made mistakes, uh, trying to to be respectful of them is important. And I think, and I think listeners like that. I think listeners like to, to hear that when they are listening to content. Yeah. I think there were two points in our podcast journey where I thought that Brett wasn't going to follow through. The first time was when he said, do you want to do a podcast? I thought he was not going to follow through. But the second time was, as we'd said, we'd recorded for, you know, a couple months before we released anything. I never actually thought Brett was going to release any episodes and I was fine with that. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm a very, I'm an extrovert. I like people, but generally in terms of like people, I don't know, I'm a kind of a private person just because of things in true crime. Uh, people often ask, you know, why don't you want to, for everyone to know who you are, where you live? I'm like, do you listen to true crime? Like people are, are, they will come after you. Right. I don't feel like someone waiting at my door when I come home and know where I live and, uh, you know, be carrying a hatchet while they're doing it. And so generally, I mean, my voice doesn't exist like on the internet before this podcast, right? I'm not someone who likes having YouTube videos of myself up and I don't post public pictures of myself or my family. And I was afraid. I was really nervous when Brett was going to press publish. I was like, people are going to hate me. It's going to be terrible. They're going to hate us. They're going to hate this. Who's going to want to listen? And Brett said something that was very important in guiding our podcast and I think is a a key to our success. He said, we're going to do us. No one's going to change who we are. And if they don't like it, they don't have to listen. And that's fine. And if nobody listens, so what? And so to this day, I mean, we didn't change anything about our format, about our music (laughs) that a lot of people (laughs) have problems with, um, about our banter about um, the way we go through a timeline, the way we approach things, uh, the way we present different theories, even if we think they may sound outrageous at first. If you listen to the first podcast all the way to now, the format is really the same. We get more comfortable, but we had the same friendship back then as we do now. And when we're recording, we don't we don't think of an audience because quite frankly, we are in our closets and um, uh, rooms and there's no one around and we're just talking to each other. And I think that really resonates with a lot of people because we're unapologetic. This, you know, you can do your own podcast and that's okay, but stick to who you are. If you flow with, you know, the winds too much, you're going to become nothing because you're going to get criticism on both sides and no one can be who you are. So you have to find what that is. You know, we say this all the time in the courtroom, you have to find your voice. 
not everyone can be an aggressive prosecutor. The person who comes in and like smashes an egg on the ground and is like, this is what you're doing to their lives. You know, people would laugh if I did that. I'm just not an aggressive looking person as I do it. On the other hand, not everyone can um, come, not everyone can be kind of the, the friend to the witness on the stand. And so you can't be coached into who you are. You just have to know who you are and you have to stick with it. Obviously take constructive criticism where it's warranted, but don't change who you are to curry favor with who you perceive to be your fans. Because if they're going to be your fans or they're not going to be, you're not going to earn them by changing who you are. Great advice. I hundred percent agree. What are some other things that you would say for somebody who maybe has been in it for a while and is having problems? Cause I talked to a lot of different podcasters every day. A lot of them are very small, but can be really good, but maybe they're having a problem reaching out to the audience that they should be engaging with. What are some things you guys have done in different communities that you've gone into, whether it be social media, you talk to Reddit and stuff like that, Brett, what are some other things you guys do as far as community outreach? Because the engagement piece is really critical and you guys have that with your listeners. Well, look, I think in anything you do, if you're a content creator, the most difficult thing is, is advertising, right? I mean, it, it, just getting people to listen to getting people to give you a chance is really hard. And, and I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're writing books, you're doing podcasts or, you know, TikTok videos. I mean, whatever you are, just getting people to click. Do you do TikTok society, videos, Brett? We do not. We talked about it. I don't really know what a TikTok video <laughs> is. I don't really know what we do in a TikTok video. Um, but, you know, look, if you're good at TikTok videos, that can be something that you can use. Uh, Sarah Turney is a good example of this, right? Like Sarah wanted to focus uh, attention on her her sister's case and her sister's disappearance and, and murder. And, and she is good at TikTok. <laughs> and she used TikTok to sort of launch her podcast and her focus on her sister. And now she's she's broadened that beyond her sister to, to other things. So I think number one, kind of like what Alice was saying, find out what you're good at. You know, I mean, some people are, are really good at Twitter. Some people are really good at Facebook. Some people are really good at TikTok. Know your audience. You know, some podcasts will naturally have a smaller audience just because the general audience is smaller, right? Like, you know, we're never, you know, we're never going to have as big a, a, a following as, as call her daddy, right? Like there's just a much bigger yeah. group of people who are interested in that podcast, not including me, but who are interested in that podcast uh -huh. than are ever going to be interested in true crime. Now, true crime's pretty big, right? But like, if you have like a science podcast, the, the, the numbers might be smaller. So don't compare yourself to, to other people and think, man, you know, those true crime podcasts are getting a million downloads in a year. And I'm, and I'm not, I must be failing. That's not necessarily true. Um, I think, you know, quantity over quality is another important thing. I mean, when we started off, we didn't have a huge fan base. We just had a few people, you know, like Harriet. I always mentioned Harriet. Harriet, our, our first fan from Scotland, right? <laughs> like, and, but we, in, we engaged with those people and we, and those first few fans that we had, who we still have to this day. I mean, I always think of them as sort of being our core audience. And, mm -hmm. and I think, really focusing on the people who, who enjoy what you're doing and be worrying more about them, frankly, worrying more about them than about whoever is out there because they like you for a reason too. And whatever you did to make them like you is probably going to make other people like you. And if the people who like you are telling their friends, that's going to grow you. I mean, we didn't do any advertising. I think we did like one ad that we paid for uh, in our entire time. Otherwise it's just been, you know, engaging on the topic. Like you said, like I, we talk on Reddit all the time never about our podcast, right? Like we never go on Reddit and say, Hey, we're the prosecutors. Come listen to us. Right. We don't do that. But if somebody's on a thread and they're asking a legal question and I know the answer to it, I just answer it, you know? <laughs> and, and I think that's the kind of thing where somebody might see that and be like, Oh, these guys have a podcast. I might go listen to their podcast. Little things like that can add up to, to really big gains in the, in the long run, but you certainly have to be patient. You know, I don't, I don't really know when, when we really started to see the podcast really, you know, start to take off, but it wasn't, it wasn't like instantaneous. It wasn't, you know, the first week we had a million downloads that didn't happen, but we just kept doing it and we, and we did what we enjoyed. We did it because we enjoyed it and we kept enjoying it and we kept doing it. And it just eventually sort of on its own was able to kind of gain steam because of that. And you still haven't quit your day jobs yet. It's important oh, yeah. to note that because <laughs> I was in an open forum yesterday, like a, like a chat. And then one of the questions they ask are what percentage of people are able to do this as a career by far less than 1%, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about a million downloads, Brett and Alice aren't retiring. 
Mm-mm. No, absolutely <laughs> not. It's not enough to feed our families. <laughs> right. And and I think that is that is a really important. You know, we talk about our expectation. Our expectations going into this were pretty low. We did not have high expectation. We've exceeded those expectations, and that's great. But you know, if you do think you're going to go in this and become a millionaire, maybe you will, right? I mean, maybe you'll just catch fire. But if you you got to just love it. You just got to love doing it. And if it really works out and blows up for you, that's just gravy, right? I mean, I think that's certainly the way we. I really, I'm not going to speak for Alice. I really enjoyed doing this. Like, I really, the highlight of my week is talking to Alice about true crime, and and that's why we do it. Now we have been successful enough that we do have sponsors and, and that's nice. You know, like I enjoy my, my green chef, you know, <laughs> like that's, that's a nice thing. Um, but as that, if, if that's why you're doing it, particularly in the beginning, then I don't, I don't think you're going to be doing it for very long. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I view us recording podcasts as just a, another hour. I get to hang out with Brett. And if, it, if I were missing that element, I think it would be a lot more, difficult because, you know, like you said, we still have our day jobs. We work long hours. There are all nighters in our jobs sometimes. Um, and we carve out time in between putting babies to bed and writing briefs to come into the closet and record something that has nothing to do with our day job. And we only do that because we really enjoy it. I want to add one other thing. We were really lucky. We did not get to where we are alone. You know, we've said this a lot of times and we'll say it again. People who were more established than us in the podcast world reached out to us and they were incredibly instrumental in bringing listeners to us. You know, Tim and Lance of um, Missy Maura Murray, uh, Maggie Freeling, who uh, has a couple of podcasts, um, most recently Murder and Alliance. They had uh, James Renner, um, uh, Philosophy of Crime, and they had no need to talk to kind of us down here, um, you know, near the dirt. But they engaged us, they reached out, and we asked them for advice. We thought, there's no way these people want to talk to us, but we just thought, why not ask? And they were willing to share their wisdom with us, and we will be forever grateful to them. And we've tried to pay it forward. Um, You know, other podcasts have reached out to us wanting to do promo swaps, wanting to ask our advice on what kind of microphone we have. And we have, I think, answered every single request that's come you know, try to answer, give them some encouragement or to tell them what we've learned along the way, because we are not, we did not start out as people who knew anything about podcasting. And so the podcast community we have found to be very, very friendly. So we try to put that back out into the podcast community. Um, So I would say if you're starting out, maybe reach out to, to people that you have engaged with on social media, or you admire something they do, and you can ask something specific of what they're doing. And you might be surprised um, what you get back. I agree. That's that's awesome. Because for me, it was very evident that Brett was running the Twitter account. <laughs> but and I wasn't intimidated at all to speak with him. And he was very open to talk with me. And I think that's what makes you guys awesome. Because you're so relatable. You're, you're humble. You're down to earth. And you are really helpful. And you are giving back, like you just said, to the people, people that helped you. You're doing the same thing. And I think that being humble makes you guys awesome. Well, thank you. I think we're awesome too. Wait, Brett, that's not humble. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hundred percent true. And and we get and I'll just say this. I mean, we get requests all the time to do promo swaps, and and I don't know that we've ever turned one down. And and I've never looked at you know how much of an audience somebody has to do it. Uh, and people have nightmare stories about the podcast community. Like we had to get vocal recently, where somebody asked us what our experience had been with true crime, and and Alice, we basically just said what Alice did. And everybody's amazing and wonderful, and they were like. Well, that's weird. I've never heard that response before, but we've had just a great experience with everybody uh, in, in true crime podcasting. I could talk to you both all night, but Brett's falling asleep. Alice, and they don't want you to fall down in the closet. So I'm going to tell a story on Alice. She okay. is literally after this leaving to drive because she has a witness interview tomorrow morning. So, you know, that is Alice's dedication. <laughs> true story. I, I really am. <laughs> well, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down and do this with me. And I think it, you guys are a great example and a valuable resource to the podcasting community and, and also as people. I'm glad I got to talk to you. Thanks well, thank for you so me. much. It's, it's an honor to be on here with you and, and we'll happy to talk anytime. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you both. We'll definitely keep in touch. Really do appreciate you listening to this episode and checking it out. I hope you continue to do so with the next I hope you have an appreciation for what I'm trying to do here. Highlight all the different things, all sorts of different creators are doing. I hope you get behind me on that and continue to join me on my journey. I'm Podcast Father, the 
indie podcaster. See you next time.